we'll have some time at the end. Uh, we're going to have a panel, so if you have any other additional questions, then uh, save them for then. Uh, next, we have Angel David Nieves. Uh, Dr. Nieves is an associate professor of history and digital humanities at San Diego State University in the area of excellence in digital humanities and global diversity. And he is currently the Presidential Visiting Associate Professor at Yale University in the Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program and is an affiliate in the Yale Digital Humanities Laboratory. He is also the Research Associate Professor in the Department of History at the University of Witty Waters one? With Waters, man. Uh, <laughs> Johannes in Johannesburg, South Africa. Dr. Nieves co-edited the book We Shall we shall independent be African American placemaking and the struggle to claim space in the U.S., as well as the new book series, The Black Spatial Humanities Theories, Methods, and Praxis in Digital Humanities, uh, with the University of Georgia Press. He also recently completed a, a work on his forthcoming book, which we're looking forward to, with the University of Rochester Press, entitled In Architecture of Education African American Women Design the New South. His digital publication, Apartheid Heritages, A Spatial History of South Africa's Townships, brings together 3D modeling, immersive technologies, and digital ethnography in pursuit of documenting human rights violations in apartheid era South Africa. Will you please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Nieves. Always a bit of a test to see how technological I am not um, when it comes to setup. Uh, good afternoon. It is a pleasure to join you all here at Bard uh, Graduate Center, and I want to thank Laura and Jesse in particular for inviting me to present and speak this afternoon as part of the symposium. I'm one of only a handful of senior scholars in the subfield of Black DH or Black Digital Humanities who engages directly with the ways that new 3D virtual reality and even augmented reality technologies can be harnessed in pursuit of documenting past human rights violations. With respect to recent history in South Africa, I address how that work alters our very notions of historical distance by shifting our perceptions of time, space, and even memory. In other words, by studying apartheid era crimes committed either by white nationalist state, by the white nationalist state, or political actors seeking to end virulent forms of race-based segregation, both black and white members of the African National Congress in particular, I've attempted to use 3D historical reconstructions as tools for promoting reconciliation and social justice. I've also argued that we can learn much about our own historical moment in the reconstruction of historical events through 3D modeling of purposefully lost or destroyed cultural heritage sites, especially given the recent rise in fascist rhetoric, race-based violence, and white nationalist extremism across the US. By way of introduction, and I'm going to be a bit messy here today, and I realize that my presentation is a little bit messy, so it kind of goes with the theme. I will confide that researchers working in critical digital humanities have been grappling with just this sort of messiness that accompanies so much of the work that advances forms of social justice DH. The 3D avatar making and modeling of historic sites that are now becoming a rapidly growing part of this scholarship are worthy of critical attention that perhaps could be seen by some as being way too granular or that belong instead within the limited purview of the faculty project lead. As I will argue briefly by opening up our research process for a wider public, we can also open up long neglected dialogues about the past. In my own work, I'm very concerned that data related to difficult or contested histories of war, genocide, or human rights violations that are made a part of a 3D model or visualization are given the serious reflection they deserve. Data related to projects such as those for Chaco Canyon or the Virtual Hampton Museum Project or the numerous slavery databases we are seeing that have emerged over the past few years need to be perhaps better situated as those projects are all replete with 3D data, tools, multimodal resources, and mashups. These 3D models should not be seen as simply a product or a byproduct of a scientifically laden research process. 
For many of my colleagues working in critical 3D modeling, we envision our work operating within an inter-, multi-, and transdisciplinary humanities-based research framework that yields a much messier model replete not only with primary and secondary source data, including photographs, maps, or architectural drawings, but also aspects of our humanities-based research process that will, in the future, not be excluded from consideration of what is most worthy of long-term preservation and historical recovery. Our symposium conveners have specifically asked us all to broadly consider how, quote, the recent advances in mobile technologies and new media are complicating, expanding, and even disrupting our understanding of temporal, physical, and social distance. End of quote. I've been grappling most recently with several themes across several broad areas in 3D modeling. Indigenous knowledge systems data, especially information as related to local social movements and activist practices, sites of religious significance, interdisciplinary community-based research processes that become a documented part of every project that includes commitments to long-term sustainability and preservation, Third, the consideration of multiple versions or versionings of 3D models, especially those related to the natural or man-made built environments that have changed over time because of advances in our model-making technologies, especially for long-term projects. I've been fortunate enough this past year as a visiting presidential associate professor at Yale to be part of another institution's effort to build a comprehensive digital scholarship and digital humanities program. This program to be housed in the Sterling Memorial Library there and in collaboration with the Faculty of Arts and Sciences. As I begin to close out my last semester at Yale, and before my physical move out west this summer, where I'll be joining the faculty at San Diego State and begin work in their area of excellence in DH and global diversity, I can now say that there's seen D digital scholarship and digital humanities practiced across a variety of institution types, beginning at the large flagship R1 State University, where I was at the University of Maryland at College Park, continuing to a small liberal arts college in upstate New York, and now at this private Ivy League university. Across the spectrum, in my various roles as a faculty fellow and as center co-director, I've become aware of the many challenges faculty, librarians, technologists, and students face in this age of cash-strapped, overtly corporatized, and STEM-obsessed institutions being shaped by professional administrators with little classroom experience. Despite some of these challenges and because of them, I'm also keenly aware that the American University is an agent of colonialism, is also a space in which decolonization is possible. For me, the university or college library is the most important agent of the decolonization process and the only place where we can make significant inroads into a more careful consideration of information access, especially as related to the experiences of long neglected, marginalized communities that often rely on community-based cultural heritage projects supported by or in partnership with our colonial-minded institutions. I was until this year a tenured associate professor and the co-director at DH um, at Hamilton College, where we were able to incorporate undergraduates in high-level humanities-based research and build a comprehensive program that focused on global diversity and social justice, with the notion that our work at the smaller scale of a liberal arts college, bankrolled largely with Mellon Foundation grant money, could eventually be replicated at a larger scale. It is within this context that I cite ethnic studies scholar Wayne Yang, who in his recent book, A Third University of Possible, writes, regardless of its colonial structure, because school is an assemblage of machines and not a monolithic institution, its machinery is always being subverted toward decolonizing purposes. The bits of machinery that make up a decolonizing university are driven by decolonial desires with decolonizing dreamers who are subversively working to wreck, scavenge, retool, and reassemble the colonizing university into decolonizing contraptions." End of quote. And I think we're already beginning to see some of the ways in which these contraptions at uh, various institutions and universities get to get used. I'm also keenly aware how much of what I'm outlining makes most library and IT scholar practitioners anxious, not only because of the subject matter question, but because of complex issues that become that much more onerous concerning ownership, copyright, metadata, paradata, and how future user communities might want or need to access this data. A better integration of our research process, methods, and especially our collaborative research processes in DH will be required along with the sorts of intersectional considerations I started outlining here and will in a moment. 
Intersectionality, a term that was coined by legal scholar and critical race theorist Kimberly Crenshaw in the 1990s, describes the intersecting identities that factor into discrimination and systems of oppression, impacting individuals and communities of the disenfranchised or those people who hold little to no power. Identity categories including race, gender, class, sexuality, and age, to name a few, cannot easily be parsed or separated out from the ways in which they might shape and influence human experience. As historian Carol Faulkner and her colleague Alison Parker have argued, that gender and race as just two of these identity markers must be seen as linked categories that shape, reflect, and situate how power, privilege, and oppression act as historical forces overwhelmingly impacting people of color, specifically in those left on the margins of any society. While there is no single way to implement intersectionality into interdisciplinary scholarship, there are numerous research strategies and theoretical frameworks with which to highlight and interrogate categories of diversity and difference. Intersectionality allows us to interrogate the ways in which racism and sexism evolved in the mid-20th century in a place such as South Africa, where I do much of my research, as they shape the white nationalist government's response to a growing black population at this critical juncture of segregation and the continued exploitation of labor, especially of black male mine workers and female domestics under apartheid's imperialist regime. Some of you already know that I'm a strong advocate that my students and colleagues in the digital humanities engage with the messiness of archive making as they document our process as scholars. Making, and I will use this word making very intentionally, and making certain that we work to better reveal the process of knowledge construction, tool and platform development, and our interdisciplinary research methods because we have fallen short in the humanities as we disclose our under the hood intellectual processes. We've arrived at a moment in the field of digital humanities, I believe, where we can now begin to more radically change humanities-based research practices and offer new ways of documenting more specifically the intellectual work of digital scholarship and digital humanities. In other words, how do we plan well in advance of the point of ingest for both documenting the research process and archive making? What are our methods and how do they even begin to address the desired workflow that allows for a kinder, gentler archive and collection making process with an eye on long-term preservation, dissemination, and even shared governance. I believe that archive making and preservation should both be seen as forms of social justice, as work to democratize new knowledge construction and the construction of new knowledge communities, especially when we are working with culturally endangered data of culturally vulnerable communities. I will admit that I'm equally to blame, both as a former department chair and a DH Center co-director, for obsessing over completeness and the wholesale adoption of the publisher-parish model of the academy that tends to overlook or downplay preservation, publication with community that, needs an inte that is an integral part of the research process, particularly in digital humanities, that we don't tend to talk a lot about. With the credentials of higher education becoming more and more critical to knowledge and global economies, there's also the understanding that undergraduates can also conduct high-level research when we use our classroom teaching as the primary vehicle for both imparting new knowledge and also teaching methods-based practice from disciplinary, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and transdisciplinary locations. Those are a lot of locations mm -hmm. that one can also be dislocated from. One case in point, is um, this program that we began, uh, the Mellon Funded Class Program, Cultural, Liberal Arts, and Society, that provided undergraduate students with comprehensive training in DH tools and methods and helped them build a unique project in partnership with faculty collaborators. Each of the students was able to leverage their experiences into internship experiences, both here in New York City at, with the British Museum, the Louisiana Endowment of Humanities, the Utica Refugee Center, and this is only to name a few. Each of these experiences for students made clear to us that the archive making process requires us to do a better job of having not only our students, but also our colleagues take seriously a clear series of preservation practices, sustainability um, models that become an integral part of the research process, even at the moment of first formulating the types of research questions that would inform their scholarship. Kieran Nevin from the University of York has recently asked, uh, during a talk at one of the Institutes uh, of Museum and Library Services Funded Preservations Forum, does 3D data comprise only models? My short answer is no. So I'll try to explain my response in my remaining time. 
Over the past year, I've been looking at and making with Dini Grieger and Stuart Malthrop's work in which they document and preserve electronic literature through the Pathfinders Project and its series of what they call transversals. For Grieger and Malthrop, video and audio recordings of demonstrations performed on historically appropriate platforms with participation and commentary by the authors of these electronic works of literature provide useful insights into the process of writing and making. It's also helped me to think through the ways in which I might begin to document the process of working in and with community to develop online heritage resources. Grieger and Malthrop have been using the Scalar platform to document the process of making in ways that allow for multimodal recording with a kind of Gertzian digital approach to thick description. In a first world context with robust bandwidth and access to a range of digital equipment, the Scalar platform is, providing is the preferred platform for this kind of work. But a greater challenge is posed in my own work in South Africa when we think about community and is to be considered among township residents, heritage professionals, and museum creators as part of the greater diaspora across the Black Atlantic. Among various contingencies in South Africa, low bandwidth, unreliable or failing digital infrastructure, and a dearth of financial resources, earmarked for public higher education, make this a very difficult task, especially in light of the movement for the hashtag fees must fall, to bring an eventual end to exorbitant school fees there. The prospect of widespread minimal computing, however, as proposed by the GoDH group, has brought attention to ways we might rethink choice versus necessity while focusing attention on an emerging movement in the DH field that, quote, akin to environmentalism, is asking for balance between gains and costs in related areas that include social justice issues in demanufacturing and reuse, end of quote. This approach is a sound methodological step forward at the outset of a community-engaged project. So now I'm going to pivot a little bit, uh, giving you much to think about here, to a case study that has been sitting on my desk uh, for a while. Um, and I'll return to sustainability, preservation, messiness, making, and community building shortly. In a recent article for Gentry Sayers, Making Things and Drawing Boundaries in the Debates in the Digital Humanities Series, my co-authors Elaine Sullivan, Lisa Snyder, and I argued that the creation of three-dimensional virtual reconstruction models of historic sites is a new form of knowledge production equivalent to traditional textual analysis that requires a better process for documenting their making. We also argue that the process of making a computer model asks scholars to perform many of the same steps described in their argumentative workflow in traditional humanistic scholarship. The primary difference is that the final product is an interactive environment. It may well incorporate a reader's liner notes, for example, and it contains not only the written word, but perhaps graphical analysis. A more traditional humanities-based process might also include identifying a research question, gathering and critically analyzing the materials, both primary and secondary, that inform that set question, and also writing an interpretive analysis using selected elements from materials to support and communicate an argument. None of this is surprising or particularly revelatory. I'm sure that's what you're all thinking. As scholars have been exposed for some time, over 25 years, to 3D modeling in the digital humanities through the work of Chris Johansson, Diane Favre, Bernie Fisher, and even Susan Schreiben. This is not an easy task to undertake because it requires a very different way of engaging with the humanities-based research process from its onset that will help document that walkthrough of your questions, your methods, your form of knowledge production, and ultimately, what your contribution might be in the field. In part, this also requires a very different approach to the documentary process when, as an activist scholar, you are engaged in community building. For example, the researcher is taking into account community opinion, analysis, design, cost, ethics, and equity. And making, there's that word again, things that are inherently messy, complex, and a challenge to present given the modes of scholarly publication already available to us that might only show some aspects of that work in process. This past summer, with our colleagues at Maynooth University, along with 16 other scholars and practitioners, we began to theorize and make a series of claims that further the arguments around 3D modeling and virtual reconstructions to now be seen in the framework of a rather long and well-established area in the DH field, um, known as digital additions. The question is begged, can we apply these sorts of analyses, deep annotation, and versioning techniques to our efforts in 3D historical reconstruction modeling? 
Practices and standards, such as the use of TEI and XML, have revolutionized the ways in which scholars may have access and to the written word from modernist texts to Shakespearean folios to inscriptions from antiquity. Increasingly, web-based technologies have made it possible to publish non-linguistic texts, such as images or musical scores, but the publication of 3D worlds or environments entails challenges well above those required for image-based editions. A successful 3D digital edition would provide users reliable academic material with the context of a three-dimensional virtual environment, such as a reconstruction of a cultural heritage site or a historical event. In addition to the processes and apparatus of traditional academic publishing, 3D digital editions must accommodate the range of technologies used by scholars to answer specific research questions and provide mechanisms to embed academic argumentation and deep annotations within a virtual space. A 3D edition is uniquely digital because it allows for the publication of interactive experiences that cannot be reproduced in print form. Publishing options currently available for 3D work are incredibly limited, um, with models used primarily for the creation of static images and captured video. Our proposed project would break new ground by emphasizing the interactivity of 3D models with the goal of letting readers interrogate the models, change variables, identify ambiguities, and trace the processes of knowledge construction. There are a number of challenges unique to 3D uh, publishing. A multiplicity of disciplines is involved with 3D objects of some kind, and each brings its own research objectives, communities of practice, and publishing expectations. And this is obviously also confounded by the many numerous platforms that exist. And as I've mentioned, at the moment, there is no single publication platform that allows for the dissemination of this kind of work, particularly the kind of work that is embedded in community. Uh, engagement. My work in South Africa speaks to the challenges of both sustainability and preservation as it represents history and heritage of places characterized by ephemerality and or absence. And now I need to escape. Now we'll see if I can do this. Uh, these include disappearance through age and degradation, intentional political suppression. What I'm showing you here is our um, platform for, uh, uh, sorry, just to show why I shouldn't be allowed to do technical things, although I'm advocating for technical things. <laughs> um, so this is a, a, a video demonstration of a platform that we had built uh, a couple of years ago to um, incorporate uh, some of the 3D technologies and some of the technologies for publishing we've been talking about. So my projects combine text, objects, architecture, maps, and consideration of human action in a past three-dimensional world to create a layered means of accessing primary and secondary source materials. My most recent work, including a case study I'd like to discuss briefly that attempts the recovery of the LGBTQIA activists in the anti-apartheid movement and examines contested events and hidden and difficult histories in ways not currently possible in standard or currently available online publication platforms. Our work to build the social justice history platform integrates time, space, and text in ways that necessitate sophisticated solutions for powerful 3D content. Um, so we've been working, and this is now in our alpha form, it's built atop for those who are gamers, the Unity platform, the social justice history platform were designed within a kind of digital edition paradigm and is able to display both 2D geospatial information such as maps, photographs, and records, and 3D representations of landscapes, locations, and 3D models of historical buildings and objects. Embedded video testimony of human rights violations committed by the apartheid state is now possible, but requires the robust features of a digital edition for comparing multiple and often contradictory accounts of these events. Testimony told to truth and reconciliation commissions to the courts for cases beyond the confines of the official TRC process and more recent ethnographic interviews with scholars require a more robust set of features for textual analysis. In particular, in cooperation with community leaders, former student activists, and family members, I've begun the process of attempting to recover the history of a young 14-year-old boy named Stompi Seppi and two other boys killed by the Mandela United Football Club 
in the late 1980s for suspicion of being government informants working against the African National Congress. Those deaths believed to have been orchestrated by Winnie Mandela during the time of uh, Nelson Mandela's lengthy incarceration remain contested, even erased, in the histories told about the tumultuous 1980s and the fight against the apartheid regime. What I'm hoping to do here, and now I'm going to switch back out of this, and back to, oh, I did this right. Um, I hope to shed light on this difficult confluence and discussion of race, racial hatred, and violence, but also the ways in which sexuality and sexual identity were used as tools of the state to mark these black bodies as less than or unworthy of the appellation of being legitimate heroes and heroines of the liberation struggle, both at the time and even today at many historic sites across South Africa. In Stompy's case, suspicion over his sexuality and intimations of alleged abuse by a white Methodist pastor marked his body as illegitimate, incapable of being a true struggle leader despite his age and his unique ability and charisma whereby he organized school-aged children by the hundreds, some would even say thousands, in protest in the mid to late 1980s. This denial of a more complex layering of this kind of history, the messiness involved in the telling of the lived reality of this queer youth killed in Mandela's own home, which few are willing to discuss, let alone remember in any detail, is perhaps one of the most glaring examples where the queer and activist communities are suppressed for a race for contemporary liberation histories. Can the methods and technologies currently available and those proposed by the larger project to build a 3D digital edition platform capable of casting new light on human rights violations that many would prefer remain erased, hidden or lost, be represented effectively, and more importantly, affectively? What are the tangible political, social, and economic costs uh, something that an intersectional framework might help to recover, capturing the memories of someone such as Stompy in the history of the liberation struggle today. Perhaps more importantly than any question I've asked here today of the many, how do we address issues of visibility, hypervisibility, and how the archive, and in this case the 3D digital edition, while preserving erased and important histories, in the process may make some more actually vulnerable. I'm left asking this question over and over in my mind and in my work. And now I return to the topics of sustainability, preservation, and the messiness at hand as I try to wrap this up. At the start of this talk, I wanted to advocate for the messiness of archive making and the importance of documenting our process as scholars, making in many ways the community an integral part of our praxis. We are very consciously making new histories and new narratives when we undertake a community-based DH practice. We are calling documentation and information from previously silenced members of the community, and this information is contested, even among the community's very principles. We have fallen short as we disclose our under-the-hood intellectual processes. I said earlier, and interestingly, Rupa Garism writes in her essay in Disrupting Digital Humanities, where she concludes, quote, that a conversation can only progress if we recognize the context in which we labor and the structures of race that surround all of us, linking our fates. Race in the digital humanities cannot be a conversation ended before it can even begin. Rather, it requires attention to the building blocks of engagement, showing generosity and patience, knowing when to listen, and learning when to speak, end of quote. With the recent passing of Winnie Matikizela Mandela just this past Monday in Johannesburg, South Africa, it makes it particularly important to refrain from oversimplifying the complexity of historical actors who were both victim and perpetrators of crimes during the apartheid regime. As Shireen Hessam, professor of political studies at Leiser at the University of the Rand, has argued, quote, Winnie Matikizela Mandela's life has been overburdened by tragedies and dramas and by the expectations of a world hungry for godlike heroes on whom to pin all its dreams and one-dimensional villains on whom to pour its rage. Yet perhaps it is in the smaller and more intimate stories of our stumbling to make a better world that we're best able to recognize and appreciate the meaning of the life of Medikizela Mandela." End of quote. So such a stumbling through a form of queer spatial microhistory would help, I argue, to lay bare the continued erasure of these youth activists of the 1980s who made a unique contribution to the struggle against apartheid, 
who were often overshadowed by youth activists of the 1970s. As a scholar activist, I also see knowledge production and dissemination as integral mechanisms of social change. I hope to show how I'm attempting to integrate the research I do as a faculty member with the kinds of changes I want to see at the world at large. Also, as a scholar who's researched how constructions of race have shaped the American experience and who has worked to build and support new academic programs and the establishment of innovative research centers with a focus on interdisciplinary research, I'm particularly excited about the prospect of a comprehensive digital humanities based research praxis that centers on social justice. This, in my opinion, is only possible when we begin to disclose our scholarly practices through the life cycle of our research endeavors <coughs> with a focus on documenting those processes with a critical attention to a holistic set of sustainability and preservation practices. Sadly, I won't have very many answers for you today, and I've probably raised many more questions than we can answer collectively, and I encourage you to uh, have a, an engaged conversation about how this methodology might work in practical terms. And as I've said, it's, all, it's very important that we also not oversimplify the realities of our labor and the lived experiences in those communities where we find ourselves doing the work of critical archive making while committing to social justice. Issues of race, memory, and engaged scholarship, to only name a few, are messy and require a renewed commitment to forms of praxis that reveal complexity, contradiction, and even frustration over the representation of intersectional lives. How are these experiences being documented, preserved, remembered? Requires an approach that is not about neatly packaged results or digital files per se, but ways in which preserve the messy, the complex, and the ethically challenging aspects of 3D scholarship. Thanks. things about doing that building work um, is the use of archival materials in the process because there isn't one particular place one can go to get the information required to sort of build. The extant plans of many of these uh, buildings and sites uh, don't exist. So part of what the students are able to do is to cull this information from different kinds of sources in, in a kind of interdisciplinary way, right? They're looking at things that are not necessarily um, easy to sift through. They may have to look at textual evidence. They may have to look at photographs. They may have to look at videos to pull uh, whatever images they can to get textures, let's say, or to get information about the physical spaces. Um, they spend quite a bit of time using the internet as a resource tool for gathering photographs from people who visited these sites in the past. Um, the, the data image bank of a million images, I think, is a good one um, to try to reconstruct some of that work. And, and much of that is based on, on some of this forensic move in 3D world building that's happening and that we're talking about. So the students get an enormous amount of um, information from culling all these different kinds of forms of evidence from primary and secondary sources. So they learn quite a bit about um, the ways in which archives leave certain kinds of people out of uh, the narrative, how certain things are not being preserved, how certain kinds of information can only be gathered from community members because it hasn't been put into a library or preserved by a university archive. So that's some of the ways in which students are getting some of that learning out. Mm -hmm. I have a related question to this too. And well, if you can help me phrase it almost. But mm -hmm. so with that project in particular, you've really put a thing into the world that, that I think you've done a nice job explaining as a, as a rigorous and scholarly activity. But at the same time, it, it invites, I would suggest, different audiences than maybe traditional scholarly works mm -hmm. might invite. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if you um, were to project out where, as now a creator and a maker who put something into the world, where you'd like to see it get picked up, mm -hmm. and who you would like to see it picked up, and by and, and maybe some of the different disciplines that you hope that it would serve? You know, one of the disciplines I most hope it would serve, and it's been a difficult uh, thing to make happen, is actually in the architectural world. 
Um, and I don't know um, why that is. I think um, architecture has been a little bit slow to sort of take up the digital humanities as part of its own practice. Um, one of the things I think that um, is particularly challenging about the work is uh, the way in which it isn't so much um, any hesitation on the part of community or community members or activists, but there is some hesitation on the part of other university institutions or other sites that I could see being project partners in this, um, helping to develop it. Where I'd like to see the platform being used, um, there are, and we've been thinking about ways in to, which to make this extensible so that other social justice-based projects, particularly museums of conscience um, around the world, can begin to use the kind of time-based um, and, um, uh, and the embedded nature of the kinds of materials we're putting into the worlds as part of the tools for sort of telling their particular narratives. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to hopefully try to actually develop some of the training that would allow actually people in the community to use the platform as well. So we've talked a lot about ways in which, and, and one tends to think that 3D construction is quite difficult. It is depending on the level of reality that you want to sort of show and display, but there's quite a bit that can be done with very simple model making that can be a part of this sort of recovery process working in community. So developing skills in community in a way that allows for um, community archivists to sort of take up some of this work would be something we'd like to see happen as well. So a broad range, um, but again, it's kind of a difficult sell given some of the bandwidth kind of issues that, um, you know, propose, uh, that are challenging for um, this kind of work. Uh, so how do we sort of deliver it in a different context? And in many ways, it was also talked about how do we sort of get some of this to be mobile technology? So how do we get some of this to work actually through mobile means? Um, because it isn't something that um, can be set up at every community center or in every museum, but maybe we can find regional ways of bringing small community-based projects together to work on the platform together. Yeah, um, I'm very interested in the idea that when you make a model, you're trying to get the most reliable information in every aspect. And, uh, you know, once Wikipedia came up, now no one looks at Wikipedia is editable. So my question is, you mentioned something about contradictory accounts mm -hmm. and um, in terms of we're able to change type, we're able to change people's writings and put it into, you know, with the resource. Are you familiar with the Adobe program VOCO? Mm -hmm. VOCO was a program that came out of the movie industry where they mm -hmm. didn't want to pay uh, actors to come back and do revoicing. Hmm. So they're able to to take the speech of somebody hmm. and when it gets digitized into writing, then they edit the writing hmm. and then they're able to have the person speak it in their language, in hmm. their voice, hmm. edit it. Hmm. So it, it's possible, you know, basically save money, hmm. to, you know. But this could be a very um, destructive means of creating a false, you know, so it's, I'm just wondering whether you are familiar with that, because it's like fake news on steroids. <laughs> I, I don't know that particular program, and I think one of the challenges for this kind of work is to really show the messiness in which many people's memories about particular events um, are often very contradictory. And so one of the things that we're trying to do, particularly in picking up the sort of language and tools and methods of digital editions, is to represent those different versions of the same narrative so that we can see the moments of disjointedness, see the moments of connection, um, and then try to understand how that can be played out in the 3D environment, how the 3D environment actually amplifies some of that. Um, I've been working with some colleagues who've been doing uh, work, I worked with some colleagues a couple of years ago who were doing a lot of this work for um, the Holocaust Geographies Project. And they were actually trying to map the ways in which testimony and narratives about the Holocaust might tell us a very different way of understanding 
uh, what occurred, how, for example, uh, certain view sheds um, from a particular vantage point in the camps might have actually allowed for those imprisoned to have moments where they could escape or moments where they could change what it is that was going on in their environment without being seen by the guards. So this is sort of a high level GIS um, modeling that's going on, but it's been very interesting to see that kind of technological development and how that's allowing us to think a little bit differently about how people resist in particular kinds of spaces and how we can then incorporate different kinds of narratives in that 3D environment to begin to sort of think differently about the many challenges that people faced in, in the camps and in similar situations under dictatorship and other kinds of uh, government. I guess there's always a frustration of um, realism in yeah. building these, and so you are never going to recreate the exact thing. Same with the arch, it's never going to be the same arch, even though that arch was not the same arch as it once was. <laughs> so uh, I can see how that building something like this has its rewards, but also there can be a frustration built in to the, uh, this kind of like uh, diminishing returns at a certain point where you can't remake the exact village, of course, right. nothing can be. Uh, so I've been also working with a colleague out of Germany that's um, been using a 3D reconstruction of Auschwitz um, to try the handful of last remaining soldiers that are still Nazi soldiers that are still living. And what they've uh, done is uh, to both recreate something that would be evocative of those spaces, isn't photorealistic necessarily, uh, but have used that to help jar the memories of those who were in the camps. They've also um, modeled, and, and when I mentioned um, Chris Johansson, Diane Favreau, and others from UCLA, um, there are different sort of ways in which they've modeled spaces and buildings, right? So they actually do the massing of buildings as opposed to the photorealistic, depending on the kinds of questions that they're asking. Other colleagues have done that in the work to reconstruct Bergen-Belsen and to then use that uh, for a kind of immersive experience using VR technologies. Um, so that again, we begin to sort of get a better sense of what some of that experience might have been like, but never truly you know, real, uh, but at least sort of evocative of some of those kinds of uh, feelings and, and, and how those spaces may have impacted uh, resistance, uh, inability to resist in different kinds of ways. I use Wikipedia. And actually, um, Wikipedia educate. Sorry, I do have a question. <laughs> uh, Wikipedia I wasn't edu Wikipedia. I'm just saying some people don't go to it anymore. Ah. Students. Some. You know. um, it's all, they're also using Wikipedia now. There was a, 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 anyway. I believe it was countrywide. It was definitely here in New York. Um, to um, expand um, information about women. Mm -hmm. And we were doing a lot of work out with, with our students at CUNY on that. So there's a place for everything. That's wonderful. Um, and on that note, because I do think it's intriguing about this idea of, um, because, because it's also getting at like, what's the truth? Whose truth are we reflecting upon? And so there's all this critical thinking that Exactly. you've alluded to. Um, and so I was wondering if, if you've had the experience, or your students have had the experience of wanting, wanting to, once perhaps recognizing that, and mm. um, wanting to say, I don't know. I, I think, like, what, I, having not gone through the experience myself, I can only imagine, like, wanting to change the color of something, mm. or add something. Like, wouldn't it be great to have some, something like mm. that here? That could have been. We don't, maybe nobody ever said that there was or wasn't, but mm -hmm. I don't know, something like that. So any kind of expanding yeah. of that. So it raises an interesting point about uh, the townships. So there were idealized versions of what the townships were supposed to be like, and there were PR campaigns by uh, the apartheid regime that uh, constructed sort of uh, mm -hmm. fake environments with fences and uh, flowers and trees of all sorts. Um, and then what we know was actually built were not those environments necessarily. So 
there's a moment at which, you know, what if we were able to have built the townships, let's say, in the actual model community form that they were envisioned, these kind of garden cities, what might they have been like? What difference might there have been in forms of resistance, the kinds of stories being told? Uh, that provides a kind of window into mm -hmm. it a bit. Um, I do talk to the students quite a bit about that. There's a uh, sort of somewhat famous uh, propaganda photo of uh, small children with bonnets and uh, dolls sort of walking down the street in uh, Soweto in this kind of fake Soweto that was created as part of the nationalist government sort of PR campaign to say how wonderful these communities are. Look, um, you know, we are improving the lived experiences, the lives of these mine workers and these household servants. Look at, look at what we're providing them. And so that, I think, provides a little bit of that that I think you, you're after, sort of getting at uh, what if. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. We're going to take Thanks. a quick coffee break.